The Danbury Drum Corps, as it is now known, was organized in 1927 as the post-60 American Legion Drum Corps. The Legion home at that time was at the corner of West and William Street, when cars look like this. Currently, this is what the site looks like. The Corps was formed by the music-minded members of the American Legion for the sole purpose of recreation and to carry on the tradition of military music. Officially and legally, the Corps became the Danbury Drum Corps in 1952. The first appearance of the Corps was on Memorial Day 1927, with 25 members marching. The marching attire and instruments were purchased by the members themselves. In 1930, the Corps raised money for its first uniform, consisting of the white and black doughboy uniform, black boots, and tin hats. In 1932, there was a reorganization, whereby the Corps became Legion-sponsored, but also allowed young men to join that were not Legion members. In 1934, the Constitution and bylaws were voted on and adopted by the Corps. From then until now, modifications and additions have been added or deleted depending on circumstances. During the 30s, rehearsals were held in many different places, both indoors and outdoors around Danbury. The Masonic Temple, shown here, the State Armory, the Legion Home, a second-floor hall across from the Hotel Green, Lee's Field, and the Danbury Fairgrounds. During this period, the Corps mainly turned out on the street, However, in 1939, it entered its first competition in Middletown, New York, and walked off with five first-place prizes. John Hill, who was one of the first charter members, served as president from 1937 to 1946. His influence, direction, character, and management during the early years contributed greatly to the success of the Corps. In the early 40s, a building, or as some members refer to it, a barn in the back of the Elks Lodge on Main Street, served as headquarters. During the war in the winter months, the members burnt railroad ties instead of coal for heat to save money to send subscriptions of the Connecticut Fifers and Drummers newspaper to members in the armed forces. It was so smoky in that building from that heat, it was terrible. I mean, that, that was a really tough building to, to do anything with as far as playing. But we managed to stay there a few years, and uh, then eventually we uh, got the White Street School, and then we moved from the, the Elks Hall up, to, up until the White Street School. In 1942, the Corps, along with other local corps, performed at the dedication of Rogers Park. Free popsicles were given out to all the children attending. Performances by the Bethel Cadets, Grassy Plain, and the Hatter's Drum Corps were enjoyed. Later that year, the Lions Playground, located at Osborne and Hospital Avenue, reopened for the year, with a very large crowd attending and the same corps participating. We, we did a lot of community work. I mean, again, going back to the war, we did all of the bond drives, all of the biggie uh, awards that were given to uh, the various uh, factories in this community that uh, did war work. And so we played at many, many uh, ceremonies uh, in, in the community for this effort. Fourth of July usually meant midget auto races and fireworks at the fairgrounds. A few times, the Corps gave a concert between events. During the war, one of the biggest patriotic events was when the Danbury and Bethel draft contingents formed at Elwood Park by the courthouse after arriving by bus or car. They would then proceed to march up Main Street, down White Street to the train station, where they would board a special train taking them to Fort Devens in Massachusetts. Led by the Corps, 
the contingent was roundly cheered by large crowds along the thoroughfare. But in many instances, freely flowing tears were evident. Younger members were kept busy during these years by helping out on many scrap drives, and a young Don Melillo organized sport activities to keep their interests going when not marching. Well, of course, during those years, the young people, in order to keep the car active and everything else, we had a baseball game team, we had a football team, we played basketball. We also, of course, besides being in the barn and back of the Elks, uh, chopping uh, uh, railroad ties and going to other places of uh, rehearsal, uh, the competition was a big thing with the young kids. And so we went to many, many, many competitions through the year. We didn't have that many parades because of the war years. Uh, there wasn't too many volunteer firemen parades. And so everything was a little bit different uh, than it is today. In 1944, during World War II, Corps members not eligible for service in the armed forces combined with the Greenwich American Legion Drum Corps to form the 8th Infantry Connecticut State Guard Band in Niantic, Connecticut. During World War II, the Corps had 68 members that served in the armed forces. Two members paid the supreme sacrifice. PFC Santo Magazzi and PFC Vernon Rydell both lost their lives in the Philippine Islands in 1945. In 1946, 58 members of the Corps recently discharged from the services attended a welcome home meeting at the new American Legion home on Elm Street. Transportation of equipment to competitions and parades around that time was by a trailer pulled by a car. Members went to the functions riding in their own cars or with others. The Corps has led the Connecticut and Danbury American Legion contingent many times in Boston, Philadelphia, and up Fifth Avenue in New York. In the late 40s, a popular occasion in Danbury was the lighting of the Christmas lights on Main Street during Thanksgiving weekend. A crowd in excess of 10,000 usually turned out for the festivities. In 1949, the Corps won the first place prize of $500 in the Lions International Parade held in New York City for the best musical unit. Shown here, receiving the check. In 1951, the Corps participated in the official beginning of Little League Baseball in Danbury. Shown here is the current field at Rogers Park. I can remember going to, uh, to the competitions years ago with, uh, we would go the day before, Peter Kreitsch and uh, Eddie Sacco, Steve Fainer, the Moffa boys, and, and we'd wind up pitching our tents and being right on the competition field uh, the day before, and when the other course came, we were already there. Fortunately, we were able to win most of those at that time. In the early 50s, the Corps rehearsed and had its headquarters at the old White Street School, located near the corner of White and Wildman Streets. The Corps eventually bought this building. In 1955, the building was sold and demolished later for a Grand Union market. Currently, the location looks like this. Property was purchased on Shelter Rock Road, where a new headquarters building was erected. This housed the Corps until 1966 when it was sold. Busy schedules, maintenance, upkeep, and lack of interest contributed to the reasons for selling. The Corps since rents the Catholic War Veterans Hall on Chavoy Lane. It uses the hall for meetings and rehearsals and has its own quartermaster's room that houses its uniforms and equipment. Rehearsals are very important because, as you know, if you don't rehearse, you know, you're not going to be good. And we do spend uh, every Wednesday, you know, it's only a couple hours, but it's intense time where we are down there to learn and we want to make ourselves better. So rehearsals are fun and they're also, uh, also a time during the week that we get to see each other and what's going on. In 1960, 
The Corps participated in a Volkswagen bus TV commercial that was filmed in a small shopping center in Wilton, Connecticut. The commercial showed the Corps marching, how many members could fit with their instruments into the bus, and finally, how easy it was to back into a parking space. Afterwards, it was learned that the bus actually pulled out of the space, and the film was reversed to show it backing up. In the early 60s, the Corps, in association with the Connecticut Yankees Drum Corps from Stratford, Connecticut, held an annual Tournament of Champions competition between various marching and maneuvering corps. The contests were held at the Osborne Street Stadium, with crowds up to 3,000 attending. In June of 67, the Corps played a concert at Yankee Stadium between games of a doubleheader played by the Yankees and White Sox. It was also Danbury Day, when a contingent of Danbury residents was present, and Bat Day, when the fans were given Little League baseball bats. The Corps dressed under the stands near the Yankee bullpen in right field. When it came time, marched from the bullpen to center field, down the infield, and played three or four songs, then marched back. The stadium was just about filled, and as we turned around and went back to center field, I noticed up in the upper left field stands, there was a empty section, and that's where the drum corps would end up after it changed. What was really funny was how long it took us go from our changing area to those stands. It took at least two to three innings until we reached it. But at least I can say, I played at Yankee Stadium. In 1968, the Corps made a recording celebrating 40 years of existence. It consisted of 13 songs and was titled, Down Main Street. Another recording was made in the 70s, which was titled, Danbury Drum Corps in Concert. During the 70s and early 80s in late September, the Corps participated on weekends in a very short parade held in the afternoon at the great Danbury State Fair. It was basically an agricultural fair that had a midway, a big top, along with a racetrack and grandstand. It drew a large crowd from miles around. The parade snaked through the fairgrounds with various bands, floats, animals, and humorous characters. Many spectators lined up along the parade route to watch. After traversing through the grounds, the parade marched onto the racetrack oval that came around and passed by the grandstand, which was usually packed, waiting for the show to begin. The reward to the marchers was to be allowed free admission to the fair. Most members and their families took advantage of this privilege. The Danbury Fair, we, uh, we did that uh, once a year. That was quite a, quite a nice time for us to go over there and parade. Uh, I don't recall how many years we did that, but we did it for quite a few years. I know Grassy Plain was one of the first ones to ever do it. And then uh, we started going there, and it was, uh, it was really an enjoyable time for the Danbury Fair. In fact, we all miss it right now. We wish it was back. Since the mid-80s, the Danbury Fair Mall now occupies this location. In 1976, the big event for the country was the celebration of the Bicentennial, and Danbury was no exception. The city hosted a huge parade down Main Street with the Corps in the lead. In 1977, the Corps celebrated its 50th anniversary. Many events took place. The highlight of the year was a trip to Disney World in Florida, in which the Corps marched in the afternoon parade through the streets. Marching in Disney World is probably one of the highlights of my career. I think there's nothing like marching in front of that castle in front of all those people. I'm pretty proud that uh, my son Michael is approaching 20 years now. I think he's, in fact, it's probably this year he's going to have 20 in. And I'm glad that he's going to join me in a 20-year club, and I feel quite happy about that. A gala ball was also held at the Amber Room in Danbury where various dignitaries and guests attended. 
1980, the local community held a rally at Danbury High School in support of the 52 American hostages held in Iran. The Corps supplied the music. It should be noted that during the years, the Corps has won many trophies for its marching and playing abilities. In 1980, the Corps won 70% of the first place trophies and parades where prizes were awarded. The standard marches that were used during the time. We always associate John Philip Sousa because he was the king of the marches. Then we went on to some happy music. We put in some polkas. We put in some uh, pop music. And present there in the core, we're using pop tunes, uh, show tunes. And what it really has done, it, it increased our roster of music to having a well-rounded repertoire. In 1985, the city of Danbury celebrated its tricentennial with a huge parade, which the Corps led. Then they returned to the beginning and marched again with a float that ended the parade. The Corps is no different than other organizations in that new members are always needed. This booth was set up on Main Street in hopes of attaining them. On that day, during the parade, a plane flew a banner behind it, above the parade route, advertising the Corps. In 1987, the Corps enjoyed a trip to Washington, D.C., filling two buses with members and guests. This picture shows the people on the steps of the National Archives. Also that year, the Corps gave a concert to herald the arrival of Santa Claus to the newly constructed Danbury Fair Mall. In 1989, the Corps, along with the Greenwich American Legion Corps, marched together as a unit in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Greenwich. In the late 80s and early 90s, the Corps participated in the Vietnam Memorial Dedication the Rally Day Parade for Desert Storm, which was held on such a cold day that the saliva froze in the trumpets, and also the dedication of the Korean Memorial at Rogers Park. In the early 90s, the Corps gave concerts on stage at the Charles Ives Performing Arts Center, located on the West Side campus of the Western Connecticut State University. The Corps traveled to a studio in New York City to film a segment of a documentary titled His Father's Song, a story about the young Charles Ives, a composer who was a Danbury native. The Corps' performance, as seen here, depicts Ives as being a complex and brilliant composer who maintained that he was able to keep up to six rhythms going in his mind at once and that he could hear everything he wrote in his imagination. Recently, the Corps gave a concert on the field at Bethel High at night during a competition between high school bands, which has become a very popular event in this area. Oh, yes, I remember the Memorial Day that we did four parades at once, and I think we did it once, and we said, that's it, never again, <laughs> because uh, it was in, uh, we went to Danbury, we went to Brewster, we went to Richfield, and I think we went to Putt Lake. During the years, the Corps has marched in various uniforms. The first one consisted of a white shirt, dark blue pants, black shoes and tie, and the American Legion fatigue hat. In 1930, the Corps purchased and wore doughboy-style uniforms, which were white with black cross belts and boots and headgear of tin hats. 
In the late 30s, the Corps changed its style to a white cadet uniform with a white Shaco hat, black plume, and white shoes. The drum major wore the same colors, but his jacket usually was in reverse color of the Corps. In the 40s, the Corps decided it needed a second or number two uniform to wear when not using its full dress. Since it was turning out at more and more parades, we had originally ordered a, a set of white cadet uniforms, and because of the war, the shortage of materials, were, we were not able to get the uniform. And uh, so we went into a black uh, Eisenhower jacket with white pants, and we had an overseas cap. In the 40s and 50s, the Corps wore white jackets and pants with black cross belts, black Shaco hats with white plumes, and white shoes. The color guard in the late 40s retired its black jacket and tin hats for the more modern look that the Corps had. In the early 60s, the Corps changed its second uniform to a black blouse shirt along with a black Shaco hat and plume. We've had uh, two or three different styles of uniforms. This newest one is is a wash and wear uniform for these inclement days that we don't want to gamble with the new uniforms or the West Point style. In the late 60s, the Corps added more black to the full dress jacket, along with red and white piping. This and a red Shaco hat and belt led many of the members to affectionately call this the Penguin uniform. In the 70s, the Corps went back to the all-white jackets with black belt and red cord trim. From this uniform on to the present, red would become a more dominant color in the jackets and shirts. The drum corps colors being white, black, and red. In the 80s and early 90s, the Corps wore all-white dress uniforms with a red sash and drop, red Shaco hats and plumes. Since the late 30s to the present, the Corps has worn white shoes with black heels and soles. In the early 80s, the Corps dramatically changed its number two uniform to a white shirt with red stripe and black trim. But the biggest change came with the pants. It was the first uniform the Corps had with black for the color. In the 90s, the Corps added more red to its blouse shirt and added a black stripe. The pants remained black with a white stripe down the sides. During the years, the Corps has also marched in casual dress, as shown here in red jackets. Also one year, the color guard marched in shorts when the weather was hot. I personally uh, I remember with the fatigue uniforms or the second uniforms, the color guard for two years uh, actually marched in Bermuda shorts. And uh, that we can remember. Uh, that didn't last very long. We got a little older and a little hairier. The Corps currently wears this dress uniform. In 1943, the Corps had a repertoire of eight songs. Now it has twice that number. Among the more popular songs that have lasted through the years are the Thunder March, Washington Post, and IORM March. Some songs have been played, dropped for a number of years, and brought back. Since 1927, the Corps has played over 100 different marches, songs, and arrangements. Originally, the Corps had as instruments fifes, valve bugles, and drums. From that point, the horns graduated from the single valve to a three valves instrument, which is basically a trumpet. And there was a period of time during the transition that the Corps used both bugles and trumpets. But eventually, the bugles were phased out and it became an all horn line with the uh, baritones and the, um, the normal trumpets. In addition, of course, they had fives, bells, or glockenspiels, as they're technically named. By 1953, the instruments consisted of fifes, bells, tenor drums, bass drums, cymbals, trumpets, and newly purchased baritone trumpets. Most music parts were written with just the melody, 
with some second and third parts for the trumpets. Songs such as Colonel Bogey, Beer Barrel Polka, Rocky, Anchors Away, and Medley USA were some of the more popular songs. The Corps lately has adopted a more modern sound with songs such as Phantom, Olympic Spirit, Prince of Thieves, and Malaguena. More emphasis has been put on various instrumental arrangements. I feel that music is important for not only the organizations that may hire our services, but also for the members. There's a period that you have to enjoy what you're doing. And when you're playing the same kind of music constantly, it becomes trite and it's boring. A very popular event held by the Corps is the annual awards banquet held at various locations each year. The awards at one time were given out at the Memorial Day breakfast, but because of time restraints, banquets in April were deemed more appropriate to award the recipients. During the evening, trophies are given out for perfect attendance, years of service, section of the year, and other deserved awards. Spouses, girlfriends, relatives, and guests are always invited. The highest honor to come out of this banquet is the 100% Attendance Award, which a member attains after marching in all parades and turnouts in the past year. Another highlight is initiation into the 20-year club, if a member qualifies. The 20-year club was organized in the mid-60s for members that had completed 20 years of active service. Any member attaining this goal automatically is inducted. The 20-year club, um, yeah, I think that would be a, a definite goal for anybody in the drum corps, not just myself. Just um, reaching the peak of being in the drum corps with other people that have been around even longer than you. But 20 years is, is, is a fascinating goal to, to achieve for, to strive for. The 20-year club is strictly social. However, when called upon by the Corps, will always help, assist, or give advice to better the good and welfare of the Corps. If you take three miles as an average and multiply it by 25, which would represent the average parades the Corps participates in each year, members would have marched 1,500 miles, which is the equivalent of marching to Dallas, Texas. And if you were to be in the club for 40 years, it would be like marching to Los Angeles, California, which is about 3,000 miles. I'm a year away from the 20-year club. Uh, to when I was a boy, it always seemed like a long way away. And my father always told me when I was younger that uh, the guys in the 20-year club have all the wisdom and I should listen to what they have to say. The club currently has 22 members, with seven previous members deceased. The motto being Old Reliables, a very appropriate title for this very dedicated group. In the 40s, the Corps sponsored many fundraising shows that were held in the Elks Auditorium on Main Street. Many were minstrel shows, as shown here on the stage. But among the most popular of shows was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, a satire that was presented and acted out by Corps members dressed in various humorous attire. Many times, another Corps was invited to practice with us. The Greenwich American Legion Drum Corps repertoire was similar to ours and often came. It was one big jam session. Drummers are a unique group. Uh, as everybody knows, we are probably annoying to some other people in the uh, Corps because we like to drum a lot. Uh, we may drum at unopportune times that people would like to sit down and talk and drummers are drumming along. Uh, as far as the weight of a drum, a drum is heavy uh, and a drummer never gets a break. And there's always one thing to remember. You've heard of drum corps, they got fife and drum and drum and bugle. They always got to have a drummer. At many of the picnics that the Corps holds, members bring their instruments and enjoy what is called jamming, which is just playing various songs for their own pleasure. 
Some members enjoy cooking and serving food at some core functions. Others just watch or offer opinions or advice on various technical problems. Others just enjoy trips with their spouse. Some relax in or by the swimming pool or shaking hands with Mickey. I'll tell you, I've been, I've been a lucky guy. I've had three families in my life. My first family is naturally my wife and my five children and now seven grandchildren. And my second family has always been the drum corps family. And my third family has been my work family. Well, I put 38 and a half years in the work and I've lost that family, but I still got my other two families. And I'll tell you, it's uh, the friendship and the camaraderie that we have is something that you can't buy and I treasure it. Everybody loves a parade, and the marchers are no exception. Parade day starts out meeting at the Corps headquarters. The bus arrives. The members load up the equipment and put their uniforms on the bus and take their seats. When the bus arrives at the location of the lineup, which is at the beginning of the parade route, the members dress in the uniform of the day and unload the equipment along with the other necessities that may arise. Most of the buses that we uh, hired uh, were from the Danbury area and they were pretty much the Flying Eagle lines. Of course, um, they weren't always reliable and it's from that that they got the nickname as the Dying Eagle and there were times when we had to physically get out and push. The fire department that the Corps is marching for is usually already there along with other Corps members that decided to travel by car. The lineup can be anywhere. The lineup generally consists of the Corps in front, then the firemen, then their equipment. The Corps participates in many firemen inspection, anniversary, and convention parades that are predetermined by the sponsoring local or regional departments. They also determine the length and route of the parade. We've been in some parades where they've taken us through uh, uh, some city streets that uh, are residential areas, and we always have the, uh, the uh, thing about it. We say, boy, these people must have paid uh, some donations to the fire department to have them go by their houses. Drum corps provide the music for the firemen to keep in step, to enjoy the music, to win trophies. The spectators along the parade route enjoy the music provided. The drummer players got a lot tougher than the fifers and bells, I tell you that, because when you're playing, you got to come up with a lot of hot air to go up them long hills. The best parade, I, I think, would be every year when we march in New York City in October, when it's cold in Pl for Plosky Day, um, just being in New York City and marching down Fifth Avenue. Along the parade route somewhere will be a reviewing stand where dignitaries and judges view the parade. This can be where the units are judged for prizes that are awarded at the close of the event. judged on their marching ability, equipment, and overall performance. The drum corps are judged in various categories such as best musical and best overall. Lately, the judges have been judging on the street, 
or anywhere along the parade route. which usually ends in a big field or park, the Corps, after putting away its equipment and changing into street clothes, then enjoys refreshments and friendship in the bullpen. The bullpen is a fenced-off area after a parade where the marchers enjoy soda, beer, and whatever food the host company decides on. Usually it is hot dogs cooked in every imaginable way. Trophies to the winning participants are usually given out in the bullpen to end the evening. Through the years, the Corps has always been involved in other activities. One of the more popular events are the overnight trips to other cities where the parade is to take place. Some convention parades have what is called a fun parade that is held the night before the formal one. Getting ready and what to wear regardless how outlandish you dress, is part of the fun. Hey, even Elvis showed up at this one. Here are members playing while marching together in a very relaxed mood and not really caring if they blow the wrong note. Who knows, they might even be playing a different song. Of course, the firemen also get into the spirit of the parade, and come up with various costumes that include spots and exaggerated posteriors. The Women's Auxiliary of the Drum Corps was formed in February of 1955. The membership is made up of immediate female relatives of Corps members. It is primarily a social group, but aids the Corps in whatever manner needed. Potluck suppers, bake sales, the annual Memorial Day picnics are some of the functions the Auxiliary undertakes and sponsors. Meetings are held monthly, with elections held yearly. Without their support, the Corps would not function as efficiently or effectively as it does. The Corps has played an important role in the lives of many families. Don met Dottie through her participation in another Corps as did Mac and another Dottie, and Frank and Pat. Peter met Bonnie after a parade in Lake George. Other families consisted of father, sons, and nephews. The Bogus family had two brothers, a brother-in-law, and five sons. The Travis family had father Art in the color guard, and sons John on the drums, and Ralph playing the trumpet. The Cavallo family had Father Ed, recently deceased, along with sons Edward Jr., Alan, and grandson Michael. The Stilson family at one time had four members, of which Linford, better known as Sonny, was the father along with three sons. Currently, the Northrop family, with drum major Frank and sons Brian and Scott, reign as the largest drum corps contingent with the Cavallos. However, the Haber brothers caught up recently with the addition of their younger brother, James. In the Gabordi family, it was all drum corps. I met my wife. Uh, actually, we were in school together, and this 
in Danbury High School and uh, really never got to know her that well, but I met her at a competition. She was a member of the Danbury Hatters and uh, it really uh, became a flourishing love and uh, we finally got married. We've been married now 47 years and uh, we also have three children. All of our children have been involved in drum corps. Truly, the Gabordi family is a fine example of family tradition and unity through drum corps. I think that during, during uh, my presidency, uh, you know, many things happen in everyone's pres presidency. And we were very, very fortunate through all of the, the, the years since 1927 to have the continuity of leadership that has kept the Danbury Drum Corps uh, way above many, many corps. In fact, the majority of corps have never had, you know, the good fortune of the leadership of, of our corps. Truly, the Danbury Drum Corps has given the opportunity to over 1,200 men and boys during its 70 years of existence to participate, perform, and play marching music for the entertainment of millions of spectators. It's a great organization, and, and all of us work to keep it going. It's been a great thing all of our lives, um, and where we've uh, gotten to know many, many friends, and there's been tremendous experiences that we've had throughout the Northeast uh, involved with, with taking part in events with the Danbury Drum Corps. The Corps looks forward to continued success in the future, in its playing and marching abilities, in its group activities, and above all, in its family traditions.